Okay. Um, and Jen, you could scroll through and just show a range of these pieces, but then get back to this one. Okay. I'll, I'll make a general statement about all this work, and then I'll just talk about that one. So you don't have to show them all, but just a couple. Um, so everybody can hear me okay? Yes. Cool. Uh, so for the last few years, one of my art processes has been casting in glass oil cans that I get on eBay for like $2.45 or whatever. Um, and these, so there's a whole bunch of different shapes and this is a few of them are on this accompanying George's poems. Um, they, I think of them, they have many, many associations for me anyway. And of course one is oil, which was bad. So I called this big oil and their little oil can. I mean, I called this little oil as a reference to big oil. Um, and also then a friend of mine referred to them as small oils and I realized they could be about oil painting and that's kind of funny, like, would you like to come and see my small oils and then show them actual little oils. Um, but in, in the case of George, and so there are many other things, I'll leave it to you, there people have had all sorts of associations with them. But in the case of George's poems, now you could go back up, Jen, to the one he's going to read, I think, the, with the um, Abacos, yeah. Uh, this is just such a beautiful photograph, not by me. It was by Denise Frege at a show I was in. Um, but I thought of all of these, they're vintage, they're sort of pre-digital, they're from this in the industrial age. Uh, whatever you think of oil, this isn't crude oil, these are oil for you know lubricating things. And every one of those shapes, Jen just showed you a couple of them, was for a specific, I mean, they're altered because I play around with the shapes, but they're based on, <laughs> Every oil can is different that I've done. I've done about 90 of them. And they're all for a purpose. There's a specific purpose to that shape. And it's sort of this wonderful industrial age where gizmos had so much personality and individuality. So in the case of George's poem, um, I was just thinking, uh, George used the word talismanic. I, I just think of it as an example of the kind of, um, the sort of, as some sort of a small object from a lost era that might have been left behind when you had to flee your house because of bombing or because of an invasion, which is George's grandparent, grandmother's story, and um, is only, and so this object, which may have had only personal meaning or may have been, uh, be beautiful in its own right or not, but it's something that was left behind that's very sort of small and humble and only exists in memory or in photograph as a connection back to this lost world. So that's what motivated me to put these on with George's poems. Since uh, David Ferry's name was mentioned earlier, I just wanted to say that he sends his regrets um, his macular degeneration makes it uh, very difficult for him to use Zoom. Um, I'm delighted to be part of this collection and especially to have my work paired with my longtime friend, Catherine Jackson. Um, Catherine said a little bit about this, uh, but my father was born in a tiny village in Arcadia, uh, way up in the Peloponnese. Uh, he came to America just before the start of the Second World War, uh, which eventually found its way to that tiny village. And this poem is called Akubos from a Drone. It's only when I open up the attachment that I see it as seen from above the clouds. My father's village, way up in the Peloponnese, Olympian email sent to me by my cousin, Perry, Pericle Pericles Christopoulos. Stucco houses clustered against the cliff, terracotta rooftops bright as pistachio nuts, and that sugar cube at the very peak, it must be tiny St. George, Akuvos, with its olive groves aglow Akuvos, as seen by the eagle of Zeus. Akuvos, as photographed from a drone. But nothing like that snapshot I saw as a child. Whenever I entered our parlor, 
for it was always Akubos up close, but not in color, circa 1940. For all I knew, it was all in black and staring back at me from under the hood of her shawl. I mean that village grandmother I never met, but there she was, ancestral shade with one hand over her heart and lo, in the valley of the shadow of our empty parlor, I saw it, the voice of silent lamentation, Akubos from a drone. Thank you. Thank you. There we go. Um, so this is a detail of a larger piece. And I just like the photo so much, I separated it out as an image in and of itself, but it only exists as a, as a photo. Um, the piece itself is two panels of etched glass. It's about, I forgot the size, but like 40 something inches by something on the side, I don't know. Um, and then in front, I have a glass disc hanging and the disc is, is maybe two and a half inches thick. It's just two pieces of glass that have been um, you know, glued together. So you look through that for just a part of the whole image. So that's what, and you get all this reflection and so on. But um, this photograph, which is just, a, as I say, just the lens is called This Fabulous Shadow, which is a fragment from a poem by Hart Crane, an elegy to Herman Melville. And the full line is this fabulous shadow only the sea keeps. Somehow it had an underwater feeling to me and especially kind of this lush azure underwaterness that's, that Hart Crane is so incredibly brilliant at evoking. But it struck me as just uncannily appropriate for Tom's poem, which is about, oh, I should say in, in Hart Crane's poem, which you should look up, it's only, I think, four, four short stanzas and it's this gorgeous elegy for Melville. Um, a whale makes its thrashing appearance in the third stanza. So anyway, this Tom's poem is about it starts out with the image of a whale's eye. <laughs> so it just couldn't see, I couldn't think of anything more apropos. So that's all I'm gonna say, Tom, it's, up, it's your show now, so. Okay, well, uh, Catherine, you're totally right. It was uncanny how these two things crossed. Uh, we certainly didn't plan it that way. Uh, but um, one thing I love about the images is, is um, that it has the appearance of an eye, but all with that kind of burst of aqueous color in it and the kind of radar screen graphicness of it. Um, and it also looks like this instrument that's looking deep underwater or out into space. And given the fact that you mentioned Melville, um, that's actually one of, the, one of the places where, you know, this poem came from. I mean, the poem is called, My Mother Has the Eyes of a Whale on her 92nd birthday. Um, and of course the poem comes out of, um, you know, going on a whale watch, which I'm sure a lot of you have done, but also it's what Catherine was talking about. The, um, there's a wonderful passage in Moby Dick in which um, Melville starts to speculate on the nature of the uh, whale's eyesight. And that's because the whale has its eyes in the side of its head. They're not, um, you know, located in the front. So it doesn't have binocular vision. And so well, Melville begins to speculate whether or not the whale can entertain two separate images in its brain at the same time. And because it's got this big brow, it's kind of moving. Uh, it can't see what's in front of it. Or it can only see what's happening, passing alongside it. And I thought that was a kind of a beautiful you know, metaphor for, you know, old age. Uh, you're moving into the future, but you can't see what's coming at you. All you can see is what's happening at the periphery. <coughs> so my mother is 96 now, uh, which is astounding to me. But anyway, uh, one last thing I'll say is there's a word in the poem, mall. I, you can't read it, but it's spelled M-A-U-L, like the like a blunt hammer as opposed to a shopping mall. So, uh, my mother is the eyes of a whale on her 92nd birthday. 
Ripples rack the chop inside the harbor, swell blown back to white water, deep ocean drawing a dark line. The whale turns emerald passing under the stern, pupils tiny and the huge maul head, eyes the size of a colt's eyes, but located like its ears on either side of the head, so that the pupils can't see what's coming from behind, nor what's swimming toward it from the future. As if the salt and pepper head were to tower upward like a great mountain between two lakes in the valley, so that your pained eyes would always see two different sights at the same time. In one eye, your sleepless nights. In the other, your drifting, lightless zones. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Anna. Uh, really wonderful to be part of this collaboration. Thank you so much, Tom. It's great.